Okay, good morning. Today we're going to do a teach back on the subjects of COPD, COLD, right? And then we're going to talk about fluid balance and deficit. At the same time, we're going to talk about acid base disorders, right? So let's start first with um, COPD. Does anybody know what COPD stands for, class? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So obviously the organ system involved here is what? The lung, right? So let's try to review what we have in the lung, right? So this is our lung here. Okay, so let's see. Uh, the mouth is there. So when the air goes in, when we inhale through the nose, air goes into what? The pharynx, right? So nasopharynx from the mouth and the nose. You can either inhale through the mouth or nose. Air goes into the pharynx, you have naso, oro, and laryngopharynx. Then you have the larynx there, right? And the opening called glottis, with the epiglottis there. And in front of the neck, that is corresponding to your, what, your thyroid cartilage, right? Okay. And then, of course, you have your trachea there. And then the trachea divides into what? Primary bronchus, and then secondary bronchus, and then the tertiary bronchus, and of course the bronchioles, right? And then of course the reason why they're called terminal bronchioles is why? Because it's obviously where you find at the end. I'll double, double just check, okay? And apparently when you look at this, at the end you have your what? Your air sac. At the end of the air sac, what do you have? Pulmonary what? Capillaries, right? And the capillary is a blood vessel, therefore you expect to find blood there. And the blood contains red blood cell. The red blood cell, if you recall, is the one that transports what? Your oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? Okay, so let's put, that is a red blood cell there. If the blood came from the right ventricle through the pulmonary trunk, right? So it came from the right ventricle. And then you have the right pulmonary cellular valve and then goes into the pulmonary trunk, divides into two right and left pulmonary arteries, one to the right lung, one to the left lung. So the blood in the right side of the heart is what? Rich in carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide is being transported by the red blood cell, and then by diffusion from high concentration to what? To low. What do you do with the carbon dioxide? Exhale. Why? Because it's waste, we do not need carbon dioxide. Do you understand, okay? So apparently, therefore, as you can see here, when you do not need something, you get rid of them. Like when we make poo poo, waste, stool. What about when we make wee wee? Same thing, it's waste, right? Urine. So, for a process of what we call urination, if you want to be more scientific, it's called micturition, right? Okay? Or another word we use is to void, voiding. Okay? Now, in the case of exhale, get rid of carbon dioxide. What do you bring in? When you inhale, you bring in oxygen, right? Exhale CO2, bring in inhale oxygen, oxygen goes in, and then oxygen goes in, and then because there is more oxygen in the air sac from high to low. So initially, the red blood cell was transporting CO2. This time, who is the new passenger of the red blood cell? I think of the red blood cell as a red bus, right? This red bus now has a new passenger, and that new passenger is what? Oxygen, and oxygen will be carried by an RBC to what? Pulmonary veins, two on the right lung and two on the left lung. On the other hand, in the pulmonary trunk, you only have one right pulmonary artery and one left pulmonary artery to the lung. But from the lung, it will be what? Pulmonary veins, it brings the blood where? To the left atrium, and for the left side of the heart, Left ventricle, and then of course into what? Aorta, right? And that's how it's being, it will be transported to all the arteries, right? To all throughout the body. Now, so apparently, uh, when you say COPD, what is the main problem here? O stands for what? Obstruction. obstruction. So, what is obstructed? The airway. So, as I have always emphasized with you guys, you have a lot of chapters to read, a lot of things to read. But what is essential is that you have to understand what you read and make it simple. Remember the word K-I-S-S, keep it simple, student. You're overwhelmed with so much things that you don't, look at the big picture. I need only to know what is important here. So what is common to all 
COPD cases would be airway obstruction. So let's start first with what we call asthma, right? You probably heard about asthma, right? Okay. So asthma, as you can see, okay, if I were to draw a table here, and in terms of signs and symptoms, you have asthma, you have bronchitis, and let's just deal with these three, emphysema. Okay? Another suggestion I make is that you yourselves make your own, create your own tables, okay? Which makes it easier for you to remember things without looking at your notes, right? So apparently when we look at this in terms of pathology, you have asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, they're all under what we call COPD. Therefore, we need to know where is the site of pathology. In asthma patients, can anybody tell me where is the problem here? Is it in the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchus, primary, secondary, tertiary bronchus, bronchioles, or air sac? Bronch bronchioles. Bronchioles. Okay, somebody got, gave me the right answer. What is found in the wall of the bronchioles? Very good. Who said smooth muscle? Who said smooth muscle? Okay, smooth muscle, correct. Here, larynx, trachea, bronchus are all made of cartilages. But once you reach the bronchial here, so the bronchial is like this, the wall is lined with what? Smooth muscle. And if you call, if you recall what you have learned in the past in anatomy and physiology, what exactly can the muscle do? It can either what contract or you contract or. So in other words, if this muscle here in the wall contracts, you have bronco what? Constriction, right? So if the muscle contracts, you have bronco what? Constriction. It's called bronchospasm, as in muscle spasm. On the other hand, if the muscles relax, you have bronchial what? Dilation. So dilation means the lumen of the airway gets bigger. On the other hand, if you muscles go into muscle spasm or contraction, guess what happens? It gets to make it develop what we call bronchial constriction. And that is the, what happens here. So essentially, many of these asthmatic patients, you have two types, extrinsic, intrinsic. Extrinsic is allergenic type. For those who have asthma, what happens, they're exposed to the allergen, like maybe the hair of the dog, the cat, or the pollen during summer, pollen from plants and trees and flowers. So apparently, you develop what? An, aller an allergy, IgE mediated, remember the word immunoglobulin E, and you develop bronchospasm, right? And what would be the signs and symptoms here? Will there be shortness of breath or dyspnea? Yes, because the airway will close. Now remember, there are millions of bronchioles and air sacs there. So can you imagine if they all close at the same time? What else would you hear? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it's called what? Very good. So wheezing will tell you that there is airway obstruction. How many of you have played the flute or the recorder? When I was a young high school student, a long time ago, in a school called Silliman, where I used to study, I was a member of the band, right? And uh, we used to play the recorder, so you create sound, the same thing here. You create a sound that is not supposed to be there. It's called wheezing. And when wheezing is seen, it means there is airway obstruction. And if you're asthmatic, you need to, uh, what do you do, what do you need to do with the muscles? What medication are you going to give? Make the muscles relax or make the muscles contract further more? Of course, you give a bronco what? Bronco dilator, right? You often have these people with the puffer, inhalers, right? They always have drugs that are designed to cause bronco dilation, okay? Now, aside from shortness of breath, wheezing, you can read it when you auscultate, you can hear the wheezing sound, or something. You don't even have to use a stethoscope to hear the wheezing sound, right? What I just recreated. You can also have, of course, mucus production. So you can have a cough. 
So therefore, if there is mucus production and cough, what do you do? You give a muco, what? mucolytic drug. Muco means mucus, lytic means what? Dissolve the mucus. In other words, if there's going to be inflammation here, there will also be inflammation. There will be increased mucus production. But most importantly, the bronchospasm is going to have a sudden onset of wheezing and difficulty of breathing. Okay? Now, very often, a lot of these asthmatic patients, the asthmatic attack is triggered by an upper respiratory tract infection, like coughs, running nose, sneezing, and uh, it always lead, it could lead to a, an asthmatic attack. So if there's an infection that requires antibiotic treatment, because there is a bacterial infection, then we have to give what? Antibiotic. Better yet, if you can do a sputum CS, because we're not really sure if there's already pneumonia, and lung infection, then we can do a sputum CS, okay? But the most important thing to do is get the bright specimen, not the saliva, but the sputum specimen for culture and sensitivity testing, okay? Now, there is a condition called status asthmaticus. What exactly is this? When patients are brought to the emergency room, of course, who is taken given priority? A patient with back pain or a patient with an asthmatic attack? Of course, remember? Airway, breathing, circulation, A, B, C, although now in CPR we do it, but C, A, B. When we do the CPR, compression, airway, breathing. But now, whatever it is, you think of those people having what? Airway problem, breathing problem, right? And therefore, an asthmatic patient, we often bring them, get the vital signs, you look at the people in the emergency room, those with airway problems and breathing problems, we prioritize them, you tell the nurse to give what? Nebulize. You know what's nebulization? When you nebulize someone, they're able to inhale and suck. We often put what? A bronchodilator in that particular <coughs> nebulizer. Okay? And then it's very, very effective. There are also times we give what? Have you heard of the word EpiPen? Okay? So we nebulize the patient. We give EpiPen, Epi from the word epinephrine, which is another word for adrenaline, which essentially is going to be also a bronco one. Dilator, okay? So we can do it intramuscularly in injection, okay? Or in the case of the hospital, of course, you can give it in a different route. Now, so that is asthma. So in this status asthmaticus, because they no longer respond to the buffers, the nebulization, you did everything you can, but they still have difficulty breathing, for status asthmaticus patients, then it's the only time we give what? Steroids. Have you heard of the word steroids, right? Okay. Now, is this problem reversible or irreversible? Reversible. It is reversible because the problem lies where? In the smooth muscles. Okay. So the, the idea here is that if you have a very solid background in anatomy and you're able to identify where the pathology is, which in this case is in the bronchial, lined by smooth muscles, then you will never go wrong. You'll always have the right answer to the questions we ask. And at the same time, this class is designed to prepare you for core nursing, right? If you get an A, as we always tell you, in this class, you'll probably get an A in core nursing, and you probably get a 99% chance of passing that nursing board exam, right? Now, Okay, now what about bronchitis? Where is the problem in bronchitis? Obviously it is what? The bronchi, right? Okay. The bronchi is the one that is inflamed. It's usually seen in people who smoke because when you smoke, what do you do with the cilia? The cilia that's supposed to line the airways. Destroy the cilia. Remember the cilia? What produces the mucus here, the mucus glands in the wall, right? So apparently in chronic bronchitis, Remember the definition of chronic bronchitis? Chronic bronchitis means coughing for how long? Two months. Three months. Three months and how many years? Two, two years. successive years. Productive cough of yellow green flag for three months. At the same time, successively for two years. And that is the definition of chronic bronchitis. Does that make sense? Is that found in your book? Right? So you always start with definitions. Like in your signature assignment, I expect that to be there, right? Chronic bronchitis. Now, there is excessive mucus production because what is the pathology there? What happened to the mucus glands? There is what? Hyperplasia, increase in the mucus glands secreting mucus, and that's the reason why there is airway what? Obstruction because of the presence of what? The mucus, right? In the bronchi, which is inflamed. 
Is that the reason why it's called bronchitis? Itis means inflamed, bronchi is the site of the lesion. The other thing you have to remember too is that, what else? Have preparation of the mucous glands. At the same time, you must remember the mycelia is destroyed with people who smoke. So think of me as cilia number one. This is number one. Cilia, Dr. Gamo is the Dr. G. I have the cilia. Remember the cilia moves like in an undulating Hawaiian dancer, you know? So if I am cilia one, this is cilia two, cilia three. Cilia one, will, this, for example, representing the mucus. The cilia one brings you to cilia two, cilia three, and then cilia out. In other words, the mucus is brought out by the movement of the cilia in an undulating movement, allowing it to be what? Cut out, okay? So apparently, therefore, if you destroy the cilia, the mucus remains where? In the airway, causing it to obstruct the airway. Does that make sense, class? The bottom line, again, as I always say, is that what, if you know what is normal, then you know what is going to be abnormal. Bronchitis, inflammation of the bronchi, people who smoke. When you smoke, you destroy the cilia. And when there is inflammation of the bronchi, as seen in bronchitis, you destroy the cilia, will you be able to get rid of the mucus? No. The mucus remains in the airway, causing the obstruction to take place. So, these individuals eventually, what is the problem? Is it reversible or irreversible? Irreversible, irreversible from bronchitis. And they develop what we, do you know what is cyanosis? Because of the lack of oxygenation, because of the area obstruction, you develop a bluish discoloration of the skin, which means there's a lack of what? Oxygen. And that's the reason why we call them blue bloaters, right? The word blue bloaters, have you heard about that? Blue bloaters, B, B, B. Bronchitis, think of blue, think of bloater. Do you understand? B, 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 okay? So, treatment, essentially more or less the same. You give a bronchial dilator to open up the airways, like your albuterol, your terbutalin, or during my high uh, med school day, we give ventolins, albutamol. You also, at the same time, give a mucolytic drug, okay? And then if there's an infection, we treat with, with an antibiotic, right? And we also nebulize the patient. I forgot to mention, we do what we call pulmonary therapy, chest precaution, if necessary. And of course, I forgot to mention that the chest x-ray could also be helpful because we want to rule out any form of pneumonia or lung infection, right? And if there need be, we do a sputum culture to determine what is causing the infection, okay? Is that clear so far? So always remember, asthma is reversible, the problem is in the muscle. You make the muscles relax, the problem is solved, but you of course you have to take care of the mucus production too. In bronchitis, it becomes irreversible because the damage becomes permanent, nothing you can do. People who smoke, 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 you end up with damage to the cilia, and take note, it's take two years in duration, right? Successive. Now, emphysema, what is the problem? Is it in the bronchi, tracheal, larynx, or the alveolar wall? Alveolar. There you go. So the alveolar wall, or the wall of the abdominal sac, is destroyed. Now, what destroys the alveolar wall? Is this seen in patients who smoke? Yes, they are, but not everyone who smokes develops this, right? Why is that so? Smoking is present here, smoking is also present here, but not all of them are, develop, are going to develop emphysema. Who are at risk of developing emphysema? Anyone? The lack of antitrust. Okay, I like this woman. What's your name? Susan, right? Race? Sonia Race. Race, Sonia Race, okay. You always come prepared for this quiz, huh? A deficiency in what? Alpha one and alpha I'm not saying I'm going to hire you now, I'm going to hire you, right? You see, I want to hire people who are going to do well where? Hopefully, in, if you are able to remember things, then you can do the right thing for our patient, right? Deficiency in alpha what? Anti-trypsin, right? Alpha one anti-trypsin. Now, would you like to explain why? What happens? What does alpha one anti-trypsin, either Sonia or somebody else? What is the role played by alpha-1 antitrypsin? You've read the book, you probably, this is the important thing here. A lot of people come to me and say, Dr. Gama, I read the book 10 times. How come my scores are to 60%? There are two possible things there. Number one, 
you probably did not understand what you have read. I'm not trying to demean or put you down. I'm just trying to make you understand how can I make the make grace better. Number two, number one is comprehension, understanding. Every time you see a word that you do not understand, look it up. Okay? Success in life comes with words. Number two, retention. You can read the book one million times. If you did not retain the information here, guess what? What will you recall during an exam? Ms. Beres Amin, what will you recall if you did not retain the information? What will you recall? Hmm? Nothing. Very good. And you know that song, nothing comes from nothing. In other words, for you to become a good nurse, you have to have a good memory. You can't be in front of a patient, oh shit, what do I do with you now, ma'am? <laughs> what the heck? She's dying, she's dying. I need to Google the answer. Google, Google, Google. Or what do you call the thing? Um, Siri. Siri, Siri. Uh, the patient vital signs is blood pressure is this, the heart rate is this, what should I do? Read your book. <laughs> I'm just joking, you will never do that, right? Because you're gonna be smart. Because you come from the best university in the world called West Coast, right? Although I feel that you're very quiet, but I don't know why, maybe you're just sleepy or something. But you should be, what? Eager to learn, okay? And you should make those neurons fire, you know? Zhu, 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 you know? The idea, therefore, is that alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, right? What does it mean? It simply means that what causes the damage in these patients that involve the alveolar wall? What destroys the alveolar wall in these patients? Can anybody tell me? Yes? Hmm? The proteolytic enzyme. You, you have to complete the word. What did you say? I said that. Proteolytic enzyme. Okay, proteolytic enzyme. Very good. Maybe my, maybe, maybe my ear is just cannot hear the word lytic. I only hear the proteolytic enzymes. Okay. You should be very clearly say proteolytic. Because what is the most important part of that word? Lytic or lytic? That's why you emphasize. What does proteo mean? Lytic means what? Lytic means what? Lytic means what? Proto-lytic! So you shout out the word lytic! I said, when I did not hear the word lit, I said, what did you say? Of course, you have a different accent, proto time. But when you say, I didn't hear the word lytic. proto -lytic! Why lytic? Because that is going to what? Break down what? The protein components of what? Alveolar wall, it's an enzyme. OMG. And what does alpha 1 anti, anti, anti trypsin do? Inhibit that harmful enzyme. Is, is, is it going to therefore protect you, the alpha 1 anti trypsin? Yes? But these individuals, what is there? Deficiency. They do not have enough of that alpha-1 antitrypsin. Therefore, they are prone of developing emphysema. The problem now is that when the alveolar wall is destroyed, is that reversible or irreversible? Irreversible. Do you understand? Okay? So, when I was in med school, I always thought smoking damaged the wall, but now I know more, right? Because the more information we get, only those people who are development of alpha-1, deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin, right? So the treatment, more or less again, for airway obstruction would be most likely the same, bronchodilators, right? Eucolytic drugs, okay? Now, regarding cough medication, right? Uh, can anybody tell me, is coughing good or bad? Good. Now, I remember, I'd like to relay a story, but I read the story to you when I was a, a medical student at a big hospital called the Philippine Jaw Hospital a long time ago. When I was a medical intern, a lot of time the mother comes to me and says, oh, Dr. Gamo, my son is sick. I said, why, ma'am? Because he's coughing. What do I tell the mother? Hallelujah! Of course, I'm just exaggerating. You should be happy, why? Because coughing is good. Because every time you cough, you're getting rid of what? <coughs> Getting rid of the mucus because what is the mucus doing to your airways or the side of your son's airway? It's blocking the airway. 
We therefore encourage them to cough out the sputum or the mucus that is blocking the airway. In fact, we tell the nurses to teach the patient proper coughing techniques. Is this a good cough? Of course not, right? What do you tell the patient? Oh, it's a real cough. I'm coughing. The diaphragm. <coughs> what else? We do chest precaution if there's a lot of production of mucus in the lung. Okay, you understand? Full of therapy, postural drainage, if unless there are any, any contraindications. Now, we have two kinds. Well, basically, we have the expectorant. What does an expectorant do? Promote more what? Coughing. Right? Expectorant. On the other hand, when you say, have you heard of the word cough suppressant? Cough suppressant. What does to suppress mean? To stop the cough, right? So, or we also call it anti what? To sin. They mean the same thing. Have you heard of Robitussin DM? Robitussin DM? The DM stands for what? Dextro Metor. Dextrometrophan. What does this drug do? Stops the cough, the coughing reflex, right? When, which one would I normally give a patient? A expectorant or a cough suppressant? I would prefer expectorant because there's a lot of mucus there, right? Therefore, when do I give a suppressant? Very commonly seen in what? Elderly patients at night, they cannot sleep because of what? Paroxysmal attacks of coughing, right? I sleep at 11 p.m., <coughs> wake up at 11.15. <coughs> Go back to sleep. Again, wake up at 11.30 in, at night. <coughs> Go back to sleep. 12 minutes, I wake up again. <coughs> Am I able to sleep? Not anymore. So what is it that I would probably give one? A dextrometrophine and cough suppressant. Only when it is indicated. It makes me go to sleep, right? Does that make sense? Now, mucolytic drug, have you ever heard of what they call dry cough? There are times when the mucus is too st sticky, it attached where? To the wall. So every time you cough, nothing comes out because it is attached where? To the wall. So by breaking down the mucus, it will be easier for you to, uh, to cough out the phlegm because no, it's no longer attached to the wall of the airways. Does it make sense? Well, I remember um, one of the famous uh, health secretaries that we had said that um, in the Philippines that water is the best mucolytic. Water is the best mucolytic, right? Because when you give a lot of water, it makes the mucus become really watery, easier to cough out. Does it make sense, okay? Now, so the same treatment, we give all this antibiotic if there is a need, okay? Again, as I have said, you would suggest that they stop what? Smoking, because when they smoke, can we all be affected? Yes, through secondhand smoke. Is that clear, class? Okay. So here we have what we call what? Pink puffers, right? And they develop also what we call a barrel what? Chest because of air trapping. Okay. When there is air trapping, you develop a barrel chest. They have the same problems. It's every obstruction. There is difficulty of exchange of gases now because why? There is a problem with the alveolar wall. And when the alveolar wall is destroyed, how can you be, be able to have exchange of gases? Is that clear? Okay. So th the idea, therefore, is that if these are conditions that are area obstruction, what is the other one that we're going to talk about today? It's called what? CRLD. What is CRLD? CRLD is chronic restrictive what? Lung disease. Lung disease, right? So essentially involving the airways, but more of the effect on what? Lung expansion, right? Lung expansion. So when I say CRLD, lung expansion and exchange of gases does not include your pneumonias involving the lung parenchyma, right? It could be bacterial or viral, right? Under bacterial, 
Have you heard of chronic tuberculosis of the lung? Right? Have you read this in your book on CRLD? Tuberculosis is due to the organism called mycobacterium tuberculosis. How do you get infected? Droplet spray. When you cough, the organism is spread into the airways, air, uh, and air, and then of course you get what? Droplet spray, right? And what happens is that you have cough, night sweats, at night you perspire at night, you have cough, and in severe cases, in later on you may have hemoptysis. What is hemoptysis? Blood, coughing out blood, thin sputum. What else? You have loss of weight and up, lack of appetite, and you become very, very thin. And sometimes you can have palpation of lymph nodes here on the neck, and in the chest you can have lymph nodes there too. The bottom line is that it is an infection that has to be diagnosed properly. Remember the word manto test? What is manto? This is the test. That's the name of the test. M-A-N-T-O-U-X. What do you inject the patient with? It's called PPD. In manto test, you inject with PPD, which stands for what? Purified protein derivative. Purified protein derivative. It's also known as tuberculin. And you let the patient come back after how many hours? Okay, this will come out in your nursing board exam. And after, let's say you do it at 6 in the morning of a Monday, let them come back on a 6 or 7 in the morning of a Wednesday. Two days or 48 hours later. Not earlier than that. Okay? And what would be a positive 10 millimeter what? What do you mean by induration and redness? It's hard. Erythema means red. Induration means it's hard. And what else? Raised. Raised or elevated or raised. Hard lesion, elevated lesion, it means that there is what? Your body is reacting what? The PPD is actually part of the tubercle bacilli, the mycobacterium tubercle bacilli, a component of that injected to your skin, and remember antigen antibody reaction, you develop what? A reaction. And when this reaction takes place, within 48 hours, it should be 10 mm or more, raised, remember the word raised and hard, now they say for HIV patient, based on what I, we see in your nursing review classes, even 5 mm is really considered normal. 5 mm, okay? HIV, immunocompromised patient. Now, does this mean that you have active tuberculosis? No, it simply means that you have been exposed to tuberculosis, right? Now people who come from countries like Asia, Mexico, other Latin American countries and other countries, they come to the U.S. and they end up with a positive result, right? With this. Question now is, what's the next step if you have a positive? It doesn't mean you have active need to do what? A chest x-ray, right? A chest x-ray, chest PAL, will tell us whether there is what? Active lesions. I remember those days when I was still in med school when we say we have cannonball lesions which will mimic what? Cancer of the lung, also seen in patients with tuberculosis. These are the people who are coughing severe uh, blood in sputum and um, lesions in the lung that can be considered malignancy would be mimicked by TB lesions. Now, but what exactly is the best diagnostic test for tuberculosis? Sputum CS, very good, okay? Because you have a special type of culture medium for this in order to grow and then be able to identify and isolate this organism. Treatment, very simple. I don't have to go into the details, there's really no need for that. When you go to corner nursing, we talk about INA, trifampicin, ethambutol, um, streptomycin, or there will always be a problem with hearing, of uh, effect on uh, hearing. Uh, it's an autotoxic drug, and it can also be a, um, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but an effect on uh, the kidney, right? Uh, it's an nephrotoxic uh, aminoglycoside. Now, what about your, uh, what is? Pneumothorax and hemothorax. Airway. Pneumothorax is simply the presence of airway yeah. in the pleural cut. Remember the lung is surrounded by what? Pleural, right? Our lung, if you touch the surface of the lung, you have two lungs, one on the right with three lobes, one on the left with two lobes. If you touch the surface of the lung, that part is called visceral what? Pleural, right? Visceral, pleural, and what is attached to the thoracic wall, the rib cage, parietal pleural. 
What do you call the space between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura? Pleural, pleural cavity. Okay, these are serous membranes, just like the pericardium. They secrete serous fluid. And what is the specific name of this serous fluid? It's called pleural fluid, right? How many of you have been stopped before? Okay, no one wants to volunteer. I will stop you now, and then we will repair it. Okay, Miss Race is smiling. Come on, Miss Race. You want to volunteer? I'm just joking. Okay. If you are being stuck, or let's say you can't shut wound, what happens to the air outside? Can the air outside go inside the pleural cavity? Okay? Now, remember, that pleural cavity should only have pleural fluid for what? Lubrication. So every time you inhale and exhale, there should be no pain. Why? Because what does lubrication do provided by the pleural fluid? Reduce the friction. Okay? So this is just going to be a very, very small space. It's a potential space with fluid. In here, no problem. But once you have a gunshot wound, a stab wound, what happens? The air goes inside. Will it occupy space? Yes. Will that air push this lung to one side? What happens to all the air sac with containing air? And air and air, air, air will what? The air sac will deflate. The lung will collapse. It's called atelectasis. Okay, what is atelectasis? Collapse of the lung. And if the lung air sacs collapses, will there be exchange of gases taking place? No. Can you die of a pneumothorax? What else would you expect to find on x-ray? You would expect that the trachea will what, shift to the contralateral side. See? Because the air will make the trachea move to the other side. Contralateral shifting of the trachea will be seen. Again, class, will this come out in the nursing board exam? Yes. That's why I always tell my students when I was doing review for almost eight years, think like a doctor, act like a nurse. In other words, be like the doctor. Know as much as you can. Learning is unlimited. When I was still a medical student, I have to learn from the nurses. They know more than me if they've been working there for 20 years. Especially the ICU. Oh my God, those were the days. ICU nurses, they were so nice. Okay. Now, what about hemo? Hemo means blood. So instead of air, you can also have hemo means blood. Can you have a combination of both pneumo and hemothorax? Yes, you can. Now, just expect the air to go up, the blood to go down because of gravitational pull, right? Do you understand? Now, of course, what should we do? We do a chest x-ray to determine where the problem is. If the pneumothorax is on the left or hemothorax is on the left, are you going to insert the chest tube on the right? Of course not. You do it on the left. A chest tube insertion, or what we call tube thoracostomy, is designed to what? To drain the air or the blood that is pushing the lung to one side, preventing the exchange of gases that take place because the lung will now collapse. Is that clear? Okay? Time is of the essence here. Now, what about scoliosis? Can, involving the... Uh, how will it affect your lung? Well, very simple. When a patient does not have a straight spine and the spine is crooked like this, look at the back of the patient and the scoliosis to the right is called dextroscoliosis. So you look at the back here and will that affect the rib cage? It does as it gets more worse, you know, it worsens, especially for 40 to 45 degrees of angulation of the spine. The rib cage will rotate. So they have a rib hump on the left, let's say it rotates to the right. There's a hump when you let them bend forward like this. There will be a rib hump on the right, and then on the front, the rib hump will be on the left because it will cause the rib cage to rotate. A lot of these, my patients before would say, Dr. Gamma, my left breast is bigger than the right. I tell them, there is nothing wrong with your breast. The size of your left breast and right breast remain the same. The only problem here is that because of your scoliosis, it made the rib cage rotate, pushing the left side of the breast forward. You think it's bigger than the right. In fact, it's not. And when I let them bend forward, there's a rib hump on the right, posteriorly, and when they stand like this, there is a rib hump on the left anteriorly. So therefore, will this affect lung expansion? Definitely it will, okay? So again, other problems would be like in muscular dystrophy and people with muscular weakness cannot affect the lung expansion, definitely, right? Is that clear, class? Okay, now let's move on to... <coughs> Oh, shit, I should have done three this. Anyway, just continue this. Bronchus, bronchi, air sac. Okay. 
this is already here, let's talk about ABG, right? What does ABG stand for? Arterial blood gases, but let's talk about acid, what? Base disorders, right? Always remember these. Let's start with the lung first, because the lung is already in front of you. Whenever we think of lung, we talk about respiratory what? Disease or disorders, right? Okay. So you can have either respiratory what? Acidosis or alkalosis. Can anybody tell me the normal pH of the blood? 7.35 to what? Anything below 7.35 of the blood's pH is acidic. On the other hand, greater than 7.45 means what? Alkaline. Very simple. In other words, anything between this number and that number range is normal. So in other words, 7.35 is normal, 7.45 is normal, 7.4 is normal, 7.44 is normal, 7.43 is normal, 7.36 is normal. It's between these two numbers. If it's 7.3, that's acidic, it'd probably be dead. It's very, very highly acidic, right? Okay, now, what is the PCO2 normal? 35 to? What about your bicarbonate? 22 to 26. HCO3 minus, B for bicarbonate, B for base. Remember that, B for bicarbonate, B for what? That's a base, right? It can accept a hydrogen ion, HCO3 minus, CO2, and what is PO2? 18 to 100, okay? So what am I trying to drive at here? Whatever it is, whether you're a medical student or a nursing student, you have to know what are the normal values because in pathophysiology, anything above or below the normal range is abnormal, right? Okay, now, we talked about what? So let's deal with respiratory acidosis first versus alkalosis later on, right? Respiratory. So when you say respiratory, what organ is involved? The lung all the time. Let's say you have what? COPD. Bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, you have pneumonia, you have all CRLD conditions. What happens is that, for example, in pneumonia or bronchitis, there is a lot of what? Mucus, right? If there's a lot of mucus obstructing the airway, what happens to the carbon dioxide? Will it be able to go out when you want to exhale the carbon dioxide? No, you don't. Carbon dioxide is not able to go out into the air sac, air, 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 now remember, everything here is air. Everything in the capillary is blood. It's a blood vessel, the smallest blood vessel. So the CO2 goes back where? To the blood. Does it make sense? Because it cannot go out, why? Because the airway is obstructed by mucus and whatever causing the obstruction. So what happens to the PCO2 level here in acidosis? High, greater than what? 45, because range normal is 35 to 45. Now remember, if you combine CO2 plus H2O, what do you form? H2CO3. What is H2CO3? Carbonic acid. Oh my God. Carbonic what? Acid. Is carbonic acid an acid? In other words, what it simply means to you is that whenever you have airway obstruction causing retention of what? CO2, you develop what? Acidosis. So you would expect the pH to be less than what? 7.35. You would expect the PCO2 to be greater than what? 45. Now I don't want to go into the details of compensation. If the problem is in the lung, what will the kidney try to do? Compensate. So what will the kidney do? You're acidic. It will try to retain what? The base, the bicarb, and get rid of the acidic substances. That's how the kidney could be good at this situation, right? Okay. So. Basically, therefore, the treatment will be simple. The simplicity of this is simple. Why? What is causing the airway obstruction? The mucus. Are we going to give a mucolytic drug? Are we going to give a bronchodilator? Are we going to nebulize and pul pulmonar pulmonary physiotherapy? And if there is an infection, treat with antibiotics, right? So nebulization, airway, postural drainage. By getting rid of the obstruction, then you can bring everything back to normal. Do you understand? So you might think, Dr. Gama, I'm just a nurse. Do I need to know all these things? Yes, you have to, because it's a team effort. We work together as a nurse and doctor team. 
So you do not just do something without knowing why. Why did Dr. Gamma order this drug? Why did Dr. Gamma order you to do a chest x-ray? Why did Dr. Gamma order this putum ZF? Why did Dr. Gamma order nebulization and pulmonary facial therapy? The simple reason you need to know why. The problem is an airway obstruction causing the CO2 not being exhaled, it goes back to the blood, causing the patient to develop respiratory acidosis. Now, what is alkalosis? Very simple. Associated with the following words, anxiety attack, hyperventilation. So what is the opposite of hyper? Hypoventilation here in acidosis, hypoventilation, hyper. That means hypo means there's not enough exchange of gases takes place. Now, it's a very common problem among, let's say, teenagers. They have a boyfriend, and then suddenly they break up. Oh my God, Dr. Gamma. If this were the CO2, what the hell do you do with the CO2? Where's the CO2 now? Out. Right? Oh my God, my, my boyfriend just broke up in the middle. What do I do now? Find another boyfriend. You're laughing, why? It's so right. There's so many boyfriends in the world. Oh my God, I'm getting old. In other words, it's important to note that if you hyperventilate, you have an anxiety attack, it could lead to what? Excessive release of CO2. So every time you think of CO2, think of acid. Always remember that. CO2 lung acid, okay? Acidosis. Now, therefore, you're hyperventilating, what happened to the pH? Greater than what? 7.45, which is alkaline, and what happens to the PCO2 levels? Less than what? Why would it be less than 35? Because you're what? Hyperventilating. You're getting rid of it. Now, do we give them, in the treatment plan, do we give them a brown bag or a bag? Why? Because when you give them a brown bag, this is what's gonna happen. So whatever they exhale will also be what? Re-inhale. Good for them? Yes. Did you understand? Oh my God, my boyfriend broke up with me! Okay, get the bag. So every time they exhale, they will be able to what? Re-inhale what they just exhale. Are we going to sedate them? Give them something to make them relax and sedate and calm? Yes, but not too much because they will, they will stop breathing, okay? Like volume per be five milligrams, the minimum amount that will make them relax. But if possible, counseling. Remember what I told you? Find another boyfriend. That's all you can tell them. You tell them it's not the end of the world, young lady. You're still so young, you're only 18 years old. When I was your age, I had 20 girlfriends. No, I'm just kidding. I never had any girlfriend in med school or high school, okay? So the idea here, therefore, is this. Relax, sedate, hyperventilation, brown bag, okay? Do you understand? Now, what is metabolic on the other hand? Anything that does not involve what? Relax. Oh my God! Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Okay? So get rid of these. So you have two kinds again. You have metabolic what? Acidosis. And what's the other one? Alkalosis. So pH here would be what? Less than 7.35, pH here would be what? Greater than 7.5, because what is the normal pH of the blood ranging from 7.35 to what? 7.45. Okay, very cl classic example here. Alkalosis. When you vomit, what's it found inside your stomach? Acid, right? So when you vomit, pretend, pretend that it's hydrochloric acid. Where's the acid now? On the floor. So what happened to you? Acid in the floor, you become what? Alkaline. See, that's so simple. You that make sense? On the other hand, when you have diarrhea, the intestinal and pancreatic secretions are what? Base or alkaline. So pretend that this is the base in my intestinal and pancreatic so If I have diarrhea, where is the base now? On the toilet bowl, right? So the base in the toilet bowl, I become what? Acidic, the opposite. <coughs> Do you understand? What about a patient in type 1 diabetes mellitus? 
The glucose cannot enter the cell because there's absolutely zero insulin. Therefore, if the glucose is not able to enter the cell, the cell will be hungry. It will use an alternate source of energy called what? If it cannot use sugar or glucose, it will use what? Fat. When the cell utilizes fat as an alternate source of energy, will they develop ketone bodies? Ketone bodies are acidic. This is called diabetic ketoacidosis. Is that a form of metabolic acidosis? Of course. Does that make sense? Ladies and gentlemen, in life there is nothing difficult if you just have a very solid background of anatomy and physiology. You understand? Now, let's move on to fluids and electrolytes, right? So this is just a brief overview. I can't discuss everything because we have limited time. Fluid balance is very important, right? Fluids. Your body is 66% water. You know that, right? 66.6% .6 water. Example, if I weigh 100 pounds, how much of my weight is water? 66.6 .6 pounds. And where do you find most of this water? Inside the cell or outside the cell? Inside. Inside, because who needs the water? The cell or the cell? So isn't that so simple? The cell. And that's the reason why you could die without water for a couple of days, like one or two days perhaps, but food you could probably last for maybe three, five days, one week. Water, no! Because that is how important water is. Water is life, is real. Now, have, you, have you heard of that expression, water is life? Water is life, yes it is, right? So, fluid volume overload. Let's start with deficit, it's probably more familiar to you. Overload, deficit is Water loss, right? Can that be due to diarrhea? Yes, so that GIT. So let's do it by system to be more organized. Can you lose water when you vomit? Yes. What about when you have diarrhea? Yes, because you're no longer able to reabsorb the water in the colon. The water comes out because it's not reabsorbing the wall, right? What about when you have bleeding, cardiovascular hema? Bleeding, right? Stop one, gadget one. Now remember, what does what, what does blood contain? Plasma. What does plasma contain? Water. Okay. What else? What about the kidney and the GUT, genital urinary tract? When you have poly what? Polyuria. Right. When you have excessive amount of urine coming out, right? Does it make sense? What could lead to these? Well, number one would be what? Diabetes mellitus. What else? Diabetes insipidus. In diabetes insipidus, the lack of what? ADH, which is a hormone produced in the hypothalamus, stored where? In the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Right? <coughs> Do you understand? Okay. In diabetes mellitus, and we'll talk about this next time, there's what? Osmotic diabetes, there's what? There's presence of glucose in the urine and that will that glucose do attract water to go into the urine, that's so why you have more what, urine coming out. Does that make sense? Okay, what else? Have you heard of the word Addison's disease? What is the what's the problem with Addison? Lack of what hormone? Lack what? Okay, you lack aldosterone. Aldosterone was supposed to what? Retain water. Water retention. Because you lack it. You lack the aldosterone, will you be able to retain the water? This is the reason why you have polyuria. Can that lead to hypovolemic shock? Yes, remember the word Addisonian crisis? Some groups here will. Who's going to talk about Addison disease in this class? Who did I assign to talk about Addison disease? Did I assign somebody here? We have the opposite, Cushing. Cushing, yeah, somebody has to talk about Addison. Who is the one talking about Addison's? Don't tell me you haven't even started to work on your project, right? Nobody remembers? Or you just forgot. Okay, what's your topic? Hmm? What? Cerebral vascular accident. Next group, what's your topic? Parkinson's. Next group, what's your topic? Hybrid hmm? Hybrid okay, your group? Huh? Your group? Cushing's. Cushing's group? 
So I didn't, I didn't assign anybody for other sense. Okay, that's fine, because you're only a few. Now, what is the opposite of other cells, therefore? Cushing's disease, right? Here you have high levels of what? Aldosterone. So will you be able to retain more water? Yes. Water retention is common, right? So what happens to the blood pressure when you retain water? It goes up. What happens to the blood pressure is low, uh, well, when you lose water? Blood pressure goes down here. In water loss or water deficit, water retention, your blood pressure goes up because of hypervolemia. Now, what is the other? Let me just combine this with the problem with electrolyte disturbance. Aldosterone promotes what? Water retention and what? Sodium retention. So in patients with Cushing's, you will be able to retain a lot of sodium in the blood. You develop hyper what? Natremia. Natremia. What is that? Greater than what? 145. What about in Addison's disease? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Hypo what? Nafenia, less than 135 for Addison's disease. Why? You're not able to retain sodium in Addison's disease. What about potassium? What does aldosterone do? So retain sodium, retain water, and then potassium what? Excretion in the urine, right? And if, therefore, if you release potassium in the urine, what happens to the blood potassium levels here, class? You go down, it's called hypo what? Kalemia, less than 3.5. So therefore, what would be the opposite in adverse disease? Hyper what? Hyperkalemia, which means greater than what? Five milliequivalents per liter. So remember these. What's the normal potassium level? 3.5 to 5. What's the normal sodium level? 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. So, where do you find hyponatremia? Addison's disease. Where do you find hypernatremia? Cushing's. Question now is, which do you think will benefit by giving them a sodium chloride solution? Addison's or Cushing's? Because sodium is given, it's good for Addison's patients. Is it good for Cushing's patients? No, because you will make it worse. Why? The sodium levels here are already elevated. Why would they give them a saline solution in your IV? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? IV fluid given, okay? When you give that kind of medication. Now, or fluids. Now, who will benefit with a banana? The banana that we eat contains what? Potassium. Who do you think will benefit? Cushing's or Addison's? Cushing's because the potassium level in the blood is low. What do you think when you take the nursing board exam and you decided to give banana to patient with Addison's? The computer would say, eh, eh, incompetent nurse, incompetent nurse, we just killed the patient by giving what? A banana. So when I say you just killed the patient, it's a virtual theoretical patient because now it will tell me that you are not a competent nurse. So should you, do you think, should I give you a license to practice nursing? No. Every mistake you have in your answers in the nursing board exam is a potentially dead patient. That's the reason why I want my students, you're like my children, I want you to be the smartest competent nurses when you take that exam because that reflects on the kind of what mind you have. A smart, a sharp mind willing to knowing all the problems that can arise with these patients, right? Okay, what else can lead to overload when you have what? Heart failure, kidney failure, right? What else? Liver failure. What is common? Many of these patients like heart failure of what? Pulmonary edema peripheral edema, right? You can have ascites for right-sided heart failure. What about liver failure? Well, they turn jaundice, yellowing of skin to the hyperbilirubinemia, which is a yellow pigment. At the same time, they what? They have what? Ascites. I remember when, again, I, I, I always like to share my experience with you. When I was a medical intern in the 1980s at the Philippine General Hospital, oh my God, I see these men who drink a lot of alcohol well, what will alcohol do? It causes you to develop liver cirrhosis, scar tissue formation, which is now irreversible. So they develop liver failure, they develop jaundice, yellowing of the skin called jaundice, and yellowing of the eye called etheric sclerae. Okay? At the same time, they have ascites. So I look at that as if they're pregnant, of nine months of pregnancy, but they're men. And they're very, very thin, okay? 
So that's why I never had a, a, a liking. How many of you drink alcohol? I don't like the taste of alcohol, but I only do it for social drinking, especially when I meet women. I'm just joking, of course. I don't really like the taste. How many of you like alcohol? Do you really like the taste? Mm. I remember I, I, I have this fraternity, the Music Mafia fraternity in Mexico. I would drink and I would just pretend to be drunk. You know? And you see these women, we review our anatomy in a place called O Place. <laughs> and we're trying to review the anatomy of these women naked and dancing. You know? And then I, I pretend to be drunk. I, uh, but actually, I only drank one bottle of beer for five hours, you know. <laughs> I don't really like the taste, but to be in men with your fraternity brush, you, sometimes I try to drink too, but you know, I think I never, I never became drunk, because I know my limit, so. <laughs> Some of them finished 12, 20 bottles of beer, only of me. Not even one half of a bottle of beer. I, just, I would just sip it and pretend to be drunk. <laughs> <laughs> And then I thought, time to go home, we have an exam tomorrow. <laughs> Those were the days of medical school, okay, so. And apparently, you may end up with liver failure. Now, another problem is the hepatitis B, right? Like, my brother died of hepatitis B and had liver failure, see? So things like this can ca cause people to die, right? Now, kidney failure, obviously, you can have, you know, edema, it's periorbital edema of the eye, you have anasarca, what is anasarca? When you have edema all throughout the body, how do you spell anasarca? Anasarca. Generalized edema. Periorbital, everything is swollen because of water retention. Do you understand? So the bottom line, therefore, is here you have too much water. Here you have lack of water. You expect the blood pressure to be low, blood pressure to be high. There's hypervolemia, hypovolemia, okay? I don't want to go into the details of treatment because it depends on what the problem is, right? And to go into the details of treatment, it's beyond our scope here. It's just purely pathophysiology, but it's obvious you have to replace what? Water in diarrhea. You have to rehydrate the patient, right? Anybody who's dehydrated, you have to replace. You should be able to recognize sunken eyeballs, dry lips, dry skin, poor skin trigger, okay? Oh, I forgot to mention OMG for me. How can, how can I be so stupid? Skin. When you have burn injury, right? So you, you notice how organized we can be if you look at it in the point of view of which system causes lo water loss? GIT. Burn. Skin. Rena. Polyuria. Bleeding. See? In other words, if you know where the cause is, you know how to treat these patients. Obviously, if it's bleeding, where is the bleeding site? Stop the bleeding. And if there's a need to do blood transfusion, do blood transfusion, a proper cross-matching, right? You understand? And treat the kidney failure or whatever it is. If they have to undergo dialysis, you have to, right? In chronic kidney disease. And burn, of course, in the treatment of burn patient, it's not just taking care of the infection that will take place if there's an infected wound, because the moment you damage the skin, it's no longer able to protect the body from infection, right? But most importantly, you have to what? Fluid resuscitation. You have to calculate, depending on the extent of the burn, first degree, second, third uh, degree burn, what else? At the same time, the extent. How many percent of the body is burned? Does that make sense? Okay? The bottom line, therefore, is we have covered acid base disorders. I have introduced some parts of electrolytes. Uh, we talked about fluid volume overload deficit. I just forgot to mention about hypocalcemia. Remember hypocalcemia? You could have latent tetany. One of the tests we do is called what? Vostek, C-H-V-O-S-T-E-K. What do you do there? With the use of two fingers, you tap the course of the facial nerve, which is front in front of the ear. When you tap, there should be a muscle, what, twitching. So if I tap myself, okay, what about trousseau sign? What is trousseau? T-R-O-S-S-E-A-U. Trousseau sign is also an exam, uh, sign of hypocalcemia, just like Vostek, hypocalcemia. Wherein, if you put the cuff, remember the word sphygmo manometer or a blood pressure recording device? You put the cuff, C-U-F-F, -F, you inflate the cuff. Sh -sh 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 -sh. Now usually between the normal systolic and diastolic, let's say 120 to 80, so it should be around 100 for around three minutes. Keep it there for three minutes, stop the cock. Sh -sh. Stop. Sh -sh. 
the cock, and then what happens is that the positive sign is that when you have carpal spasm, carpal pedal feet spasm, but it's more like this. Spasm will cause the wrist and fingers to flex like this. It's a positive what? True soul sign. Indication of what? High vocal semen. Now, another thing important thing to remember too. When it comes to calcium levels, there are important hormones affecting this. What would that be? Calcitonin from the thyroid gland. Calcitonin, if you remember, is a hormone from the thyroid gland, aside from T3 and T4. If this were the bone, you have a blood vessel there. The blood vessel contains what? Blood. The calcium in the blood goes to the bone. What happens to the blood calcium levels? It goes down with calcitonin, right? But it will make the bone stronger. I remember when I was a medical resident at the rehabilitation department, we used to give what? Nasal spray of what? Mia calcic, which is a form of synthetic form of calcitonin because it's designed to make the bone stronger in patients suffering from what? Osteoporosis. Now, what about parathyroid hormone? So thyroid gland, calcitonin. Parathyroid hormone is the opposite. In other words, the calcium in the blood goes where? I'm sorry, the calcium in the bone goes where? To the blood. So parathyroid hormone, therefore, will make the blood calcium levels go up because it allows the calcium in the bone to go where? To the blood. That's why when you have hyperparathyroidism, you have hypercalcemia. When you have hypoparathyroidism, you have what? Hypocalcemia. Low levels of calcium in the blood. Does that make sense? Okay? Always remember that. Okay? Okay, we have a short break of five minutes. After this, we can have the exam. Okay? And, uh,